Hey, what's up, folks? How you doing? Your boy Sly Jarl's here. Just kind of waiting to. Uh, Can you all hear me out there? I'm just trying to see what's... Okay, cool. So I don't know if any of you guys know, but it's uh, Jocko's birthday today. Bass thing here. We're going to talk about tone, first off, sound, and we're going to talk about, because the first thing that people, when, when someone hears you, the first thing they hear is your tone. Do you have a nice, fat bass tone, you know? If we're talking about playing the blues and playing R&B and playing like more roots-oriented music, so you want to have a really nice, fat bottom end. And then you want to have that. You want to kind of get into that tone. I like to have nice, warm bottom end and a little bit of a crisp mid-range. So I'm playing a... Uh, like a like a I guess I call it a P bass special kind of setup volume for that pickup volume for this and then overall cover with my tone. So as you can hear, I like a nice nice fat bottom end with a little bit of crisp high for when I slap. So 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 it kind of cuts through. Anyway, um, you know, ask me some questions. You can leave some questions in the comments, or, or you can inbox me. I'm on Facebook, Sly Gerald's, um, and, I'll, and I'll answer whatever questions we don't cover today. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about is time, playing time. The bass player is the, is the role that we play as bass players in Western music is we are the liaison between the drummer and between the um, the, the uh, keyboards and guitars and that kind of thing, the, the harmonic instruments. Um, so what we want to do, you know, we it's a very important role. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, and, and you bass players may want to kill me or other musicians want to kill me, the drums are the most important member of the band. The second to that is the bass. Because if you have a good rhythm section, if you have if you're a good bassist and drummer that lock in well together, that will make a band. I've been in many situations where the drummer was a real strong player, and he played really well, and he played very musical. He or she played very musical, and the rest of the band was kind of mediocre, and the band kicked ass. Because the drummer, it's all about the drums. But I've also been in situations where I was a strong player in the band and the drummer wasn't as strong and the rest of the band was decent players and the band was like, okay. It's just that liaison between 
between the drums and the bass that do it. So let's talk about playing time. Now, I practice a lot with a metronome. That's really my thing. Uh, the box is going to set you free. If you don't play with a metronome, you should. Now, let's see. This, this is it right here for me. Uh, and usually, what I'll do is I'll play with it on two and four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. That's a little up. 80, 80. I'm going to put it down to 70. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. So that emulates the sock, you know, or, or the or the or the hi hat rather. The backbeat. So let's take a like a common shuffle bass line. So we're gonna go root three flat seven in the octave, right? And we're in the key G. One, one, two. saying you want that you want that backbeat that pocket so I'm gonna I'm gonna play I'm gonna play another way here where it's not as purposeful we want to play as bass players we want to play purposeful bass lines this is gonna be a non-purposeful bass line kind of like a little willy-nilly one two three four It's kind of all over the place, right? You lock it in as a bass player. I try to with I try to play all my bass lines with purpose. Total purpose. One, two, three, four. Oh. People like Duck Dunn, uh, um, Willie Weeks, you know, play Stevie Wonder. You play, listen to any of those guys, the way those guys play time. Um, Tommy Shaw played with Stevie Ray Vaughan. Great pocket player, man. When I was a kid, one of the first grooves I ever learned was Rude Mood. Tommy Shaw on bass. And that was like, that was like up around there. And this is two and four. One, two, uh, two, three, four. Uh. Say, take a salt slide.
excuse me, messing around, but that's that's the idea about it. Playing time, man. Your most important job. In fact, nine times out of ten, you're not gonna even get a bass solo until they can they they know that you can hold down the group. I'll tell you a story. So when I when I was growing up, I played in high school, I played a lot of different I played basically the four bands I played was I played I played Rush, I played Black Sabbath, and I played um, Rush, Black Sabbath, and Van Halen, and a little bit of Yes. But those are you know, and all those guys are very very um, you know Getty Lee. They're very aggressive players, not laid back, not I mean Geezer Butler was a little bit bluesy. But for the most part, very, very aggressive bass players. So I came out of that. And I remember I I got into a band right out of high school. I got into this little um, hotel band. They used to go and do these gigs. It was a dance band. And uh, the drummer was this, all the guys in the band, I was 18 years old. Everybody in the band had to be like in their 40s or 50s. And old school road dogs, you know. I remember we're doing this gig, and we're out there playing, and we're doing something like, we're doing, I don't know, doing something like uh, uh, Mustang Sal or some some kind of standard R&B thing. And I'm like, and then my bass part was, so I was playing this, I was going, uh... drummer said, come here. He said, come here. And so I thought I was grooving. I was like, yeah, man. So I go, well, we're grooving, right? And he's just like, looking at me with one eye. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we playing some shit now, right? He said, if that ass on the dance floor, if that ass on the dance floor stops moving, you're fired. <laughs> he would yell at me to go over the bandstand, play simple, man. Bass, play, bass parts have got to breathe. Bass parts have got to breathe. So, um, so keep it simple. You know, start from very humble bass lines when you're building bass lines, especially playing blues, guy, blues, um, blues uh, gigs you, and R&B gigs. You want to really just kind of like, there's nothing better than hearing a bass player plant that one when it first comes. Like the guitar player will get up and go, like the guitar player will do something like, uh, something like.
So you know what I'm saying? What I'm saying that kind of thing. So and the other thing too is having the right instrument for the gig. You know, a lot of times, you know, you got to remember something. The major your tone really comes from your hands. That's really what it is. It's the way you attack the instrument. It's, it's, it's in your fingers. You can have like a giant SVT or you can have, you know, the most high tech, uh, you can have the most high tech um, uh, gear around. But, you know, basically if it's a clean amplifier, somewhere about 200 watts, you know, with a, with the either, you know, 212, so great, or a 15, that's fine. You know, you just want to be, have clear, good sound. So I'm going to tell you a story about having the right instrument. So back in, it had to be like 80, 89. I can't believe that. A long time. I just had, just gotten out of high school and I was starting to do some gigs with my cousin who's a pretty famous guitar player named uh, Bill Perry. And Bill got us a gig. We were backing up a lot of people. Like I backed up people like Dale Shannon. Uh, we played with uh, the Drifters, the Coasters, we did the whole oldie circuit. But we did, we got to do some old blues guys too. Like, you know, legendary blues guys. And one of the people that we got to play behind was Bo Diddley. So, of course, I lived upstate. We were going to play the bottom line with, with, with Bo. And the funny thing about it was is that uh, I grabbed the first instrument that I had my basses lined up on the wall. So I just grabbed the first, I basically grabbed one that I thought, I grabbed the first one and I ran out, and my, and my cousin ran out the door. We got down to, to the rehearsal studio because we are going to rehearse that, you know, for sound check. So, uh... We walk in and Bo Diddley's sitting there. Now, I don't know if you guys know about Bo Diddley, but Bo Diddley was a very, very big man. He was just like, you know, even sitting, the guy had to be six foot tall sitting there. And, you know, he's just a big strapping guy. He's sitting up there with all this, like, uh, with all this Indian jewelry on. And you got to understand something. He was a sheriff in, 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 back in uh, Texas. He was a marshal or, or sheriff or something like that. But anyway, he's sitting there, and he's got a cane. He's sitting there. He's sitting in his chair. And we get in, and we start taking out our instruments. And everybody's got, like, vintage instruments. Like, you know, like my cousin pulled out a, a, a 52 Tele. The other guitar player had, some, had like, a, a, like, a vintage 50 Strat, 57 Strat. And, of course, Bo Diddley had his... Um, had his uh, Gretsch, his signature Gretsch. So here comes Sly. I pull, I go, please let it be my Fender, please let it be my Fender, please let it be my Fender. I open up the case, and it's my six-string Ibanez. <laughs> six-string Ibanez, candy apple red. It was crazy. I just grabbed the wrong instrument. And uh, and so Bo looked over at me at the bass. I pulled the bass out of the case. I was like, maybe I can get away with it, you know, that kind of thing. And he goes, what, you ain't got no Fender bass? <laughs> what, you ain't got no Fender bass? And uh, so I said, well, yeah, I grabbed the wrong instrument coming out of the house. Uh, you know, uh, my other instrument's at home. And uh, he goes, well, you better go get it. I was like, oh, uh, uh, well, um, you uh, know. Okay. I said, but we live, I live upstate New York. I live at like almost an hour and 15 minutes away. He just turned to me and goes, better hurry up. <laughs> so I'm freaking out. So I end up going downstairs and calling a friend of mine. A teacher of mine had a, a friend of mine, teacher guy down, had it, lived on 14th Street. And he had a 60, he had a 68. Fender Jazz Bass, all beat the hell, but beautiful bass, you know, just beat the hell, but vintage. I, I begged them to let me borrow. I said, just let me borrow it for one night, man, and I won't, I won't mess it up. I just got to do this gig. 
grabbed the bass, went back, and he didn't say one word. I put pulled the bass out. We started to do the sound check, and Bo didn't say anything. Just looked at me and goes, "Mm-hmm." That was it. Mm-hmm. You know, and the night of the gig, you know, he, you know, we're, we're doing. Doing that, he turns to me and gave me a bass solo. Me and the drummer. So we're like, oh. yeah, that kind of thing. So it was cool. It was a very, very cool time. Uh, taught me a big lesson. Anyway, so let's talk about soloing a little bit. A lot of, a lot of folks talk about uh, bass solo. And this is, you know, here's the problem about bass solos. Most of the time, what, are, what, what happens? Okay, guitar player takes a solo. Everybody's like on the edge of their seats. They're loving it. Keyboard player takes a solo. They're on the edge of their seats and they're loving it. Drummer takes a solo on the edge of their seat. Bass player goes to take a solo. What happens? Hey, man, how you doing? What's it? Well, how you been? Yeah, man, yeah, you know, I've been, you know, getting ready to go on vacation, but, you know, people start having conversations. They start talking. They don't pay attention to bass solos. And the main reason why what is bad about a bass solo, everybody drops out. Usually, in either a jazz or a blues situation, the, the drummer will either play really, really low, or the, or the band will drop out. And what do most bass players do? It's like you, you go, you're playing, playing something like. And you get a bass solo. Good bass solo song. wrong with that the problem is is that there's no pulse you're you're here all through the, most of the song you're going as soon as you get a bass solo you're like the time goes out the window there's no time First thing you want to do, you get a solo, especially at, at a tempo, you want to play, you want to keep the groove going. The groove can't stop. Bass solo. kind of thing. You want to keep the pulse going. Okay? So let's talk about some simple some simple bass solos that we some solo concepts that we can we can go over. Again, keep in the back of your mind you want to keep the time flowing in your bass solo. So let's say let's pick a key. Let's key we're in the key of G, right? And you're playing Now, if you're playing a solo, solo play, I would start by coming from the groove where you were before. Alright? Coming from the groove. Now, let's talk about a scale that works over this. Let's take a G. I, I like to call it like a box pentatonic, 
All right, so you got G, A, C, D. Then you're gonna move up a whole step to E. G again, A, C, D. Now this works, this works over major and minor, right? So when you got a major thing going, check this out. Just, I'm, I'm just using the looper to kind of just demonstrate how to, so you can hear the time. But that's a really quick fix. Now the cool thing about it is, is that that same box pentatonic that same box pentatonic works over minor too. So let, 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 me, get my, let me get my thing here going. Here we go. here is just a blanket you have to get inside of it and start to like try to play melody lines or play solo lines that are going to kind of like but you know you want to go with the changes so I was doing a minor blues so I was playing G going to going to C minor G minor C minor G minor like the thrill is gone and then E flat E flat dominant and then D dominant back to back to back to the one. So I recommend you learn your your major and minor pentatonics. But that's a really good go-to just to start to get your vocabulary together because it works over major and works over minor. Let's do it over. Let's do that same. I just did it before, but let's do the same thing over a major. Thank you. 
also that the neck starts over at the 12th fret, right? At the, at the 12th fret, starts back over. So basically the 12th fret is like open strings. And the 12th fret is the same thing. So all that, that whole thing can also be played up here. Guitar players might get mad at you, but... So you can do the same thing. try it there. It'll have a different flavor and a different timbre to it because this is very this is very inside because you're playing where you normally would play your bass line and up here is more guitar guitar kind of uh, kind of thing. Like I said the guitar players may end up wanting to strangle you. <laughs> you know what I mean? The guitar players might want to strangle you. Uh, yes, right. I'm somebody... Who said that? Yeah, I'm omitting the third. Right, and that's the reason why it works over both major and minor, because I'm not playing a B. In this key, the third would be the B uh, of G, or the B flat for the minor. Now, if I add them, obviously, again, if I add the, the if I add the, um, if I add the B flat in there, if I add the B flat, then I'm gonna then I'm gonna be locked in to playing minor. Here's the thing though, you can play a minor third in the blues against, and it will be fine, right? So check it out. Uh oh, oh, sorry, I just erased everything. Here we go. Let me let me lay it down. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna lay down a slow blues in G for you. So. See what I'm saying? That same thing. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna touch upon this one last thing. A lot of times, either the mel you, you gotta remember something that when you're soloing, soloing is really on the spot composition. Because your job now is to create melodies. Just like you know, they call it Starman Monday. Baby. 
Now, the same thing. You're creating a melody on the spot. That's really what good soloing is. And you listen to guys, you listen to, you know, some of the great, you listen, just in guitar players alone, you listen to guys like Stevie Ray and Hendrix and people like that, David Gilmour. These guys are all playing singable melodies. They're not going... <laughs> They're not doing that. They're not doing now. You know, we we you know we look at Eddie Van Halen. We look at Eddie Van, but Eddie Van Halen actually. You got to remember, the true test of a great soloist is that you can't play their song without playing their solo. And Eddie Van Halen was. And you can't play any Van Halen song without playing. Eddie's solo note for note because it's such an integral part of it's such an integral part of the song it's the same thing with Stevie Ray Vaughan you could play around it but if you listen to like a lot of like Cold Shot listen to Cold Shot that solo you could not play that song really without playing you have to at least quote or hint at some of the stuff that he played in there anyway I'm going to cover one last thing uh, guys were talking to me about they wanted to figure out the whole slap thing on the bass. Okay. So, I'm going to try to cover this really, really quickly. Uh, so, here's the rule. Anything that you play with your fingers, you should be able to slap. That's the bottom line. Anything you play with your fingers. Now, uh, Here's the here's here's the uh, especially on a jazz bass or like this usually somewhere around around the 18th fret is like the sweet spot. Now let me just show you here. This is called if I can get get it so you can see it. See this? This is called the funk bone. That knuckle right there I call it the funk bone. I remember hearing Bootsy call it the funk bone. It's right here. Um, yeah, man. It's just slap lesson. Anyway, you want to, you basically want to, it's like turning a doorknob. That's, this is kind of, and these are your popping fingers, right? So you want to kind of turn a doorknob and you want to bounce on the bass. So what you want, so let's play a G down here. And what you want to do is you want to look on the bass and you want to find the spot where it's just nice, fat, and round. On my bass, it happens to be within this, this area right here, right around the 18th fret. Now, you take guys like, like Flea and Lewis Johnson, they slot back here. And what this is, is that when you slot back here, it's a little bit more open. It's a little bit more like, like wild. There's more overtones. And I find... You know, it's very... Uh, it's very very open now when I move it over here around the 18th fret there's a lot more control and okay let me get it get back to this 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 the fundamentals of it it's like dribbling a basketball a lot of guys play funk and they play super super hard you don't do that what you want to do is you want to kind of like like turning a doorknob you want to just kind of do this Turn the doorknob and kind of let your thumb hit the string. You want to go through the string. You want to go past. You want to hit it and go past. But you want the string to push your finger back, push your thumb back. You should be able to go... Nice and even. Okay, now the popping end, I 
pop with two fingers. So let's just do G octave. We've got G and then the octave of G, right? Now what I like to do is I like to do this. I like to go thump, first finger, then second finger. I like to do that because it gives a little bit more of a, you have an opportunity to do a little bit more picking to kind of get inside of the slap. You understand what I'm saying? Kind of. I know this is really kind of a quick overview, you know, if you want to inbox me and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but in the end, it's all about control. It is all about what feels good. Because if it doesn't feel good, you'll never get hired. Most bass players get hired because of the way they interpret or make the music feel when they come in. Like, you know, most uh, band leaders or most you know, non-bass players who are band leaders want a bass player that's going to settle the groove in the band. They want to hear when you come in. That's all they want to hear. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear, they want to hear that pulse because you're the, the bass is the heartbeat of the group. Uh, what else? Yeah, this is that's really it. There's a, I could go on and on each one of these subjects that we talked about about tone, you know, uh, about uh, about line construction and soloing. I could do just a whole series alone just on that. But anyway, uh, I hope you're able to follow this. I really do appreciate y'all stopping by and. Uh, and giving me a holler, you know, give me a holler in the comments. Let me know that you like to, you know, give me some ideas of what you would possibly like to uh, take a look at in the future. Because I, I love doing this. This is, you know, the bass is, the bass is a shit. I don't give a crap what guitar players have to say. The bass is a shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, it's just, it's the heart and soul of the band. You know, and, and there's just so much we can talk about uh, on this. All right, so have a good one, guys. May the good Lord take a liking to you and love you for the rest of your life, and I will see you soon. Thank you so much for your time. Peace. Hit me up, slidejarrows.com or slidebase.com, and hit me up on Facebook and Instagram. All right, talk to you soon. Peace.